Thank you for watching another video of the DYIO class. Before I get started, I would like to mention uh, some of our supporters. The Rockaway Times does very good with us helping um, by promoting the class. Uh, the First Congressional Church, they donate the space. Uh, the Stretcher.com, they also help market it and help show it online for me. So we got to extend a little thanks to them. Okay, so let's get started for today. Last class, we did spackling work. Where we left off, this wall was not coated this heavy. So what I did is in between classes, I gave it an additional coat. We worked on how to spackle and get the edges semi-smooth so that we can continue the work. I explained last class how spackling has got to be done in multiple levels. And I also explained how that applies to other areas. Now I want to show you a little bit about how it applies. We got two pieces of wood here. As you see, the wood's edges are curved. Well, you may not see it, but I'm going to go ahead and pass one out so you can take a look. There you go. Now, obviously, you can tell when you put them together, you're going to have a gap here. How do we fill that gap? So I'm going to tack these together. Eh, took out the short nails. I need the long ones. So as James is putting them together, I'm going to cover a few other things. There are different things to fill with. The main thing you want to work with, especially if you're working with wood, is you want to use a sandable, stainable wood fill. There are a lot of different brands. I happen to have bought the Ace Hardware brand not because I'm a fan of them, just because the price was a little less. The key thing is you want a brand name and you want sandable and paintable. That's going to make all the difference because if you want to go ahead and stain your project and you don't use something that's sandable, uh, and I'm sorry, that's uh, stainable, it's going to show through. If you're painting your project, you can use almost any fill. The other thing is wood glue. Wood glue is put out by a lot of different brands. For light projects, you could use regular Elmer's. Uh, there's a brand called Tile, Tile Brown, Bound. I'm sorry, Tile, Tile Bound. And it's for heavy duty work. We will get into that a little later when we're ready to start doing projects and actually glue them together. I'll get into the different kinds of glues. When you put the wood together, Nails are beautiful. Screws are beautiful. You always want to put a little glue where they join, though, because it always adds a little extra strength. Okay, the Elmer's is great for general work, like what we're doing here. So normally, if this was something we were assembling, I would put glue in the seam where they meet, nail them together, and then we got the gap. As I said with the last class, you don't want to leave any of your products open. If you leave your spackle open while you're working, you get dust or anything in it, it contaminates it and makes it hard to finish work. Same goes with the wood fill. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a little out, a little more than I need. I'm just a piece of wood, piece of cardboard, anything is fine to work with. Just and then put the lid on. Now I know that's safe, that's not going to get contaminated. Scoop a little on a knife. As I showed with the spackle, when you're scooping it up, you don't want to get your knife all into everything. So you want to scoop it and then lift the knife off. That leaves the back of your knife clean. You're going to get to try all this before we're done. Put a little excess. Take the knife and bring a clean edge. I know it's a little hard to see there, but I'm going to show you with hands-on in a few minutes. Now, when I filled it, it went beyond the seam. That means it's probably going to need another coat after this, after this dries. But it's going to go ahead and make a smooth transition from one to the other. That's why you want to go with the sandable, because if you just got the seam, it's not so terrible, 
but when you got to go ahead and expand it out a little bit, the sand only makes all the difference. Now I'm going to show you a little something additional, which is jumping ahead, but I want to give you a little reference. As you see, we just nailed these together. We didn't worry about the shape on them, if they were perfect. Normally, when you're working with something, you want it square. There are multiple kinds of squares. I have the three most common with me today. A square like this is very simple. It's got the lip, it lays on, and you check your edge here. Works on the inside also. So it makes everything nice, nice and easy. Square like this is good for areas where it's a little larger. Let's say you're doing a bookshelf and you want to be able to slide it down and make sure everything's straight. It's a little more convenient. You could also lay it on top or on the inside. This square is actually called an angle finder. This is something like this here that's not perfectly square. If you got to make a duplicate of it, you lay it in, it finds your angle. Now when you look, they don't actually meet. So that shows that this is not what they call a 90 degree angle. We'll cover what the angles are later on actual projects, but for right now I just want to show you the basics. This way when I bring it up with a project, you're going to be able to say, oh, I remember when Artie said this. Okay, now, a little wood fill is great, but is that all it all is for? Nope. Mind you, everything I show you here is things we're going to actually get to. And I want you to understand why all these little things mean something for later when you're doing stuff that's a lot more detailed. Everyone knows what a 4x4 four four is. It's like a wood post. This is a standard 4x4 four four that was put, I put on my lathe, which we will in the future get a chance to actually work with. And I started ripping it down just to show you the original shape, how it comes down. After ripping it down and giving a little more design, you can make it into whatever design you want. Now, when you do the design, you still got seams. Unfortunately, with, you gotta get a little dirty sometimes. With the seams, put a little in. Uh, James was supposed to leave me a rag out, but wipe it, wipe it smooth. I forgot to tell him, that's my fault. <laughs> okay, you wipe it smooth, you get your seams nice. So now this way when it's done and you do the final sanding on it, there's no cracks or gaps. There's two ways you want to look at it. For more of a rustic look, you might want that little, uh, the little cracks and everything. For a more finished look, you don't. This crack is a little wide. You might be able to see it from over there. Now, I'm doing the same thing I did with the spackle knife, but I'm just using my finger instead. Once that dries, I can give it a sanding, and that's going to be a smooth transition. So this just shows you how things apply to other areas. You can see firsthand, and you can see some of the things that you're going to get into. Now I'm going to just cover one or two little things, and then we're going to actually get some hands on. We're going to actually do what I just did here, get some practice. I didn't print a lot of them out today, but I will be including them in emails and I will be uh, having them printed out for next time. These are round tuits. Nice little circle, it's round and it says to it in it. Everyone's going to get one. All those little things you've been thinking about that you keep saying, oh, I'm going to get a round to it. Well, I'm giving you a round to it and that's it, you're going to get to it. And this is where you're going to learn how to. 
you just got questions, I want questions asked, I want to give you the answers, and I want those round till it's used. Okay? Okay, now, what we're doing here with the class is, is we're learning a lot of little things. Learning it is great. Practicing it is even better. Part of practicing it is helping others. Uh, because when you show someone something you learned, it helps refresh your memory and helps sharpen your skills. So we're going to redefine the DYIR. Okay, DYIR originally means the do-it-yourselfer. We're going to change it for D being do-it-yourself, I inspire others to learn and express your ideas. Y is going to be yearn to learn more. You got to always have that desire there. E is educate others and spread what you have learned. The more you teach someone else what you learned, the more you spread it, the more you enforce what you learn, the more you sharpen yourself. And R is readiness. Be prepared to take on different projects. Don't be afraid. If you turn around, you learn the wood fill on this, don't be afraid to use it on something else. All right, by trying on something else, there's trial and error. You're going to make mistakes. Learning how to fix them is part of learning how to do things. So there is no fear, there's just knowledge, and you're going to get it. All right, we're going to take a couple of minute pause, and then we're going to go ahead and uh, get you up here and actually start putting some of these together and let you see how it, to assemble it. Um, you're going to assemble something simple like this because later I'm going to teach you how to assemble stuff for finished products. And then we're going to, you're going to also do the wood fill yourself. All right, ask your question. I wanted to know what standard size nails you use today. Okay, when you're doing something like this because of the type of wood we're using, we're using a regular finishing nail. This way when you nail it in, and you could actually set the nail, you won't even see the head. All right. Uh, now, if you look at the nails, see there's a little hole in the middle. Mm -hmm. okay. That's for setting the nail. There's a tool called a nail set. When we're working on other projects, I'm gonna bring that in. And when the nail's in the wood, you actually put this on and tap it with a hammer and it brings the head just below the wood. As far as sizes, we're using a two inch nail. If you use an inch and a half nail and you look at the wood you're working with, you don't have much penetration to the other. Oh, okay. It's not going to hold too well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Another reason we're using the two inch nail is because it's a heavier nail. And for your purposes, you're just learning to work with this stuff. The nail, the smaller nails will bend if you don't hit them right. So we're going to avoid the smaller nails. I'm going to ask you to work together a little bit. Let's get these out of the way. Yes. But they look big nails. Yeah, yeah, they are big nails, and it took a little extra banging and a little extra work. But one of the reasons, like I said, that I did want to use in these nails, because if you use the other ones, they would have bent on your left and right. Don't hesitate to wipe the back off. Scoop a little on. Apply it to where you're working. And just like we said with the last class, tight knife, mm -hmm. same thing. Mm -hmm. See the difference? Now your wood, we did not work with a square, we did not make everything all perfect, so it's not, it's going to be a little fill. Don't be afraid to fill it. That's All right, so we had a few questions. So, Who wants to start? Yeah, we were talking about spackling, and I, and I was wondering um, if you already have a wall that's been spackled, but poorly spackled, and then painted over, what's the best method to fix it? To okay, the same way we did the last class, we're doing the fill, doing the first coat. 
And then you're going to come through and do additional coats and make it smooth. Okay. okay. I my question was, once you put the spackle on the first time, so it's pretty either thick or not even, what is the angle if you go back again? How do you get the wall smooth? Okay, when you do your first coat, you want to keep the knife tight to the wall because you're just doing a thick layer. When you're doing your additional coats, you want to keep the knife out more. So just to show you on an angle, I'm just going to use this as an example. On a wall, first coat, you want to go like this because you want to allow a heavier coat and more of a transition. Second coat, you're filling in lines, cracks, everything. You want to give it tighter. Third coat, I actually put a little bit of a bend on the knife because it's <coughs> very tight. And that creates less sanding by keeping it so tight. One of the things you will find with the wood fill, with the spackle, when you're doing heavy areas, even with caulking, if I'm caulking the seams on the molding, and let's say there's a space where there's a big gap, it's going to settle in. And there, do, there does end up with cracking and stuff. So whether, no matter what you're applying to, the concept's going to be the same. As you see, we did some heavy coats here. So now you're getting the cracks. We're going to have to go in behind that, and we're going to have to give additional coats to fill the cracks. That's going to be the same one on the wood projects. You might find on some of these where we did the fill, when we come back next, next class and we look at them, you might find some cracks in it. Okay. That's not uncommon. But that's why your base coat's got to be as good as possible. You want to pack it in, you want to make it semi-smooth, and you worry about finishing later. Any other questions? I think we got about covered. Okay, I'm gonna, I know I'm doing a little bit of jumping around, but before class, you had a comment about the, the rope basket, I believe. I just did an article on uh, making rope baskets. That's actually, I brought this in today with that in mind. There, just to give you a little insight on things we're going to be doing. A rope basket, basically you use any kind of container, you can use a coffee can, use something simple like this. And there's a way to do the rope around it and make everything secure. And the basket comes out and you got a rope basket. One of the things, if uh, you take a look at the article, is it talks about filling the spaces on the inside. Uh, where the ropes meet, you fill it with glue, and that gives it a little extra bond. That brings us back to our wood. Same way with filling gaps on here, on the inside of the rope basket, you would fill in with a little wood glue, and that's going to help hold the rope together. So when you put something in the basket, you lift it up, basket doesn't come undone. So this shows you a little more about how something like spackling a wall extended into the wood, extends into the rope basket, and extends into the floating shelf. Or even the stuff with the lathe. Everything applies to everything else. And that's one of the key things is when we have the basics down and we start learning to adapt them to apply them to other areas, it's going to make the other things easy. We're going to do the baskets and I'm going to say, all right, just put the wood fill in and smoothen it. And I'm not going to have to give you a half hour lecture on how to do it. Mm -hmm. You'll be able to say, all right, Audie, I don't need to listen. Uh, uh, shut up. And you'll be able to handle it. And that's the point, you know, as you progress, you're going to see that just happen naturally. Thank you for watching the video. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something today. Uh, remember, we will be uploading a new video every other week. Uh, we will be advancing on what we learned today, and we will take on new projects. Once again, thank you for joining us.